Let's get started. Please welcome Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Christina Liu. Oh my goodness, this mic. Um, who am I? I am a senior security engineer at Cisco Meraki. I am also a certified information Certified Information Privacy Technologist. I am at Cluthulu on, I guess it's Twitter. <laughs> and I have a website if you want to find me later. So what will this talk cover? First, we're going to get into why this is important. Second, we're going to get into what is personally identifiable information or data. Then we will go into the dangers of re-identification. Then we will end with some practical takeaways that hopefully you can go and implement. So, to better understand the power of personally identifiable data, I want to play an imagination game. And to do this, I am going to make a game for all the burrito lovers out there. I'm here to espouse the wonders of Burrito Match. This app is the hottest thing in burrito recommendation engines. This, will this app will take all of your likes, dislikes, run it through its algorithms, and find you your perfect burrito. So to do that, it will need your dietary stuff. Like, are you pescatarian, vegan, omnivore? And do you have any dietary restrictions? Are you gluten-free? Do you need your food to be halal kosher? Do you, for some reason, hate avocados? It will take all this information, run it through its algorithms, and find that perfect burrito. But not only is it a perfect burrito, it's the perfect burrito that's closest to you right now because time is of the essence when you're hungry and kind of hungover. So this app is so freaking good. You use it like every day for six months because ain't nobody got time to cook. But what if this app was not forthcoming about its data sharing policies? What if the information that you like every burrito with extra sour cream and two modellos which exceed the doctor recommended weekly good idea stuff, um, that information gets sold up to health insurance providers. And for some reason, your health insurance premiums goes up. Now, even worse, what if the information gets then sold up to organizations and companies that do religious surveillance, which is possible because it has location data and halal kosher filters? Now, this app suddenly goes from like whimsical and fun to dangerous and disturbing. So thank goodness that this app is completely imaginary, um, but there were and are apps that are personal data nightmares. Does anybody remember with the super old iPhones how the light only turned on when we took flash photography, which was a feature that nobody liked? What we actually wanted was the light to stay on so that we could use it like a flashlight. And because of this user-driven demand, there became this proliferation of flashlight apps um, all over the place. I'm going to talk about one in particular, and it's the flashlight app done by iHandy. And an analysis that was conducted by AppThority, which is a mobile security software company, they found that the flashlight app had access to the user's location, could read the user's calendar, could use their camera, and had access to the unique ID of the device itself. And with that information, they also had the ability to then send that information up to advertising networks, all without user consent. And users care what happens to their data. So, in a 2022 consumer privacy survey done by Cisco, 76% um, of the people surveyed said that they would not buy from a company that they do not trust with their data. And not only is this a trust issue, this is a user respect issue. Because whatever code you write, whatever software you're involved with building, it will impact people. And you want your impact to be positive, and you want to be building better and safer products. You don't want products rife with unintended consequences in the code and in the architecture. Because 
when privacy and security are mishandled, the consequences affect people in very real ways. So here's a chart from 2017 from experience. It was a little out of date, but it shows the dollar value of people's uh, information on the dark web. So your social security number was worth about a buck, which is kind of surprising, but passport information is worth a thousand to two thousand dollars. So in this chart, you can see some real quantifiable harms um, that this generate. And it should be obvious now that privacy is important, but like, what is privacy? So privacy usually gets talked about in terms of like buzzwords and rants in our industry. And we hear, usually hear about privacy in terms of damages in the millions of dollars lost in terms of like data breaches. But at its core, Privacy is an individual's rights to maintain control over their personal information because privacy allows people the ability to be themselves. It gives them the ability to control what to share, where to share it, and with who they're sharing it with. And thank goodness, privacy can be achieved through policy such as legal and corporate policy, and also technical engineering controls. And hand in hand with privacy comes security, especially in this modern age. We should all know the answer to this one. What is information security? But again, this industry is rife with buzzwords, rants, so many rants, and our talk of threat actors. And our most popular threat actors are always hackers, hackers, and more hackers. Now, privacy, Angelina Jolie aside, privacy, uh, secure, excuse me, security at its core is the systems and the controls built to protect information. That's, that's what it is. And the information that we are protecting are things like proprietary code, credit card numbers, and yes, personally identifiable information, often referred to as PII um, in an acronym form. So security can help achieve privacy, but it alone is not enough to protect privacy or, and PII. When we get into PII, it's usually categorized into two buckets, um, sensitive and non-sensitive. And what counts in different buckets will depend on your country, depend on a jurisdiction, depend on your laws. So be very careful when you are creating the classification for what is sensitive and non-sensitive PII. So sensitive PII, as defined by the Department of Homeland Security, is data that if lost, compromised, or disclosed without authorization could result in substantial harm, embarrassment, inconvenience, or unfairness to an, to an individual. But the TLDR is any information that can quickly and accurately identify an individual. So some examples up at the top is social security number, that number follows us throughout our lives. We need it for everything from employment to housing. Driver's license numbers, we don't usually change these unless we are moving to another state. And biometrics information because I don't have the men in black zapper, so I got to keep these. So now we go into non-sensitive PII. And that is basically information that by itself is not generally considered to be a risk to an individual's privacy or security. And so this information is generally collected for things like marketing, customer service, research, but care is still needed to ensure that the, this data is protected from unauthorized use, access, disclosure, destruction, all that good stuff because Though, even though by itself, when you take one piece of data, if you can have multiple pieces of data that then can quickly and accurately identify an individual, then that becomes dangerous. So for example, if you just have an address, you might not be able to find that person, especially if they're, if they're living in a giant apartment building. But if you have an address, a gender, and a birthday, you may be able to find the person you're looking for. So to protect data and to be able to use collected data, there's a concept called de-identification. 
And that is the tools and the techniques that organizations use to minimize the privacy risk of storing and publishing data containing PII. Here are common de-identification methods. Note here, they may be called different things depending on your industry, but the idea, very, very similar. First one we're going to talk about is redaction, is the idea of removing your removing data from a data set. So I like to think of redaction in terms of like Hollywood military movies where they'll have a letter and then they'll cut out sensitive information from it so you have like a, a letter with a bunch of holes in it. So same thing, removing data. So for example, if you have a data set that has people's names and social security numbers, can you remove the social security numbers and still get what you need done? Um, the next one is masking, is the, uh, also known as pseudonymization. It's the idea of just like uh, obscuring your PII. So instead of having clear text social security numbers, can you replace it with all stars or, or make smaller stars? Or can you run these fields through um, functions that will generate real random uh, strings and fields? Next is generalization, the idea of grouping your data to get rid of those specifics. So for example, if you have a data set where you have people's ages, so instead of publishing their actual age or using their, or storing their actual age, can you instead say that these people are over 18, under 18, over 65, under 65? Then we get into obfuscation, which is the idea of adding noise to your data. So. Again, if we think about the data set with ages, so instead of having the age, can you round their age up or down to the nearest decade? Can you instead average out everybody's age in the data set to be like, you know, between 46 and 54 or something like that? Um, a note here is that obfuscation can be aggressive and can make your data harder to use, but if you are dealing with data sets with very sensitive information like healthcare records, this could be a good way to go. So safe data handling and disclosure is more important now than ever before because companies are getting fined big time. So back in May of this year, the Ireland Data Protection Commission, Commission fined Meta 1.8 billion with a B dollars. They ordered Meta to stop sending EU users information to the US. So Meta is actually still appealing this, so only time will tell whether or not they're going to have to pay this and what they're going to be doing with that data. So protecting PII is important because we're really not anonymous anymore on the internet. And re-identification can happen from data sets that have been de-identified. This was proven in 2006 by two researchers um, from the University of Texas. Their names are Arwin Naranit-Yannan and Vitili Shmatakov. They're not actually Lego people. I just couldn't find real images of them. So in 2006, Netflix had a contest called Netflix Prize. It was a $1 million prize contest where they asked engineers to help create a better movie recommendation algorithm for Netflix. And to facilitate this work, Netflix released a data set that had information of over 10 million movies, had information of almost half a million of their subscribers, and six years worth of that data. So what our researchers did was they took the information from the Netflix data set and was able to cross-reference it from the public records in IMDB. And from that, they could re-identify the user in the Netflix data set by simply matching whether an uh, how someone ranked a movie, so did they like this movie or dislike this movie, and two of those rankings could have been inaccurate, and the posting day could differ by 14 days. And with just this little tiny bit of information, uh, Narayana and Shmatakov were 99% confident that the users could be re-identified. So kind of scary. But also, they published that other traits, like sexual preference, political party, um, and things like that could be inferred about this person because how we rank movies on whether or not we like them are very specific to our own personal interests. Another example from re-identification happening from unlikely data sources is an experiment done by Dr. Latanya Sweeney. She is the 
founder and the director of the Data Privacy Lab at Harvard. So she had an experiment that showed that you could match hospital records to newspaper articles. So she got a data set from the state of Washington, and this data set had information about patient demographics, clinical diagnosis, procedures. This was de-identified, so names and addresses were removed, but some of them still had their zip codes. So what she then did was she went to LexisNexis, which is a uh, newspaper database, and found 66 articles that matched her search term and her location, which is Washington. So newspapers are in the business of informing the public of current events. So they do publish specifics like name, age, treatment hospital, and other information. So she basically matched the information from a newspaper article to the record in the patient data set. Here is one example of that. So in the newspaper, you can see in yellow that this was a 60-year-old man, which matched back to the record. In teal, the location is Soap Lake Man, which matched back to the zip. In blue over there, the time of the accident, which is Saturday afternoon, which matched back. How this poor, this poor soul got in the accident. Um, they had a motorcycle accident, which is in green. And then the treatment hospital in orange, Sacred Heart Hospital. And in pink, you can see that the poor person's name is Ronald Jameson. So now that we know it's Ronald Jameson, we can see, also see in the patient set, uh, demographic set, is that they, he was charged $71,000 for care, and also he has a slew of other things he's dealing with, like pulmonary problems from this accident. So I am not a lawyer, um, and there are s different laws uh, that companies can be sued for or fined for if they have data breaches and mishandled data. Um, at the time of this talk, the U.S., there's, there's no comprehensive privacy law, federal law that standardizes how PII should be handled. There is one called the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, but that's still a bill. It's not a law. It was introduced last year. No idea where it's going to go from there. So as you can see from this map, um, there are different states with different privacy laws and different statuses of whether or not they're there. So all the PII enforcement stuff is really piecemeal by states. So what can we do, even though this sounds very ominous? Well, here's five things that we can do. The first rule of PII Club is don't collect or store unnecessary data. And the second rule of PII Club is don't collect or store unnecessary data. If you remember nothing else from this talk, just don't collect or store unnecessary data. If you do nothing else, this will get you far. If you're going to be storing data, two, you want to be automatically deleting old data. Create a schedule for when that data is going away. That's called a data retention policy. Um, luckily, most cloud storage systems like AWS have configurations to make this a scheduled thing so that you can set it and forget it. Three, use only the data needed to get the job done. So advocate to be incredibly selective of the data that will get processed and shared because we want to make it harder for re-identification attacks to succeed. Four, this one we all should know, build for privacy and security right in the beginning because it's never cheaper, less effort, or faster to bolt it on later. And if you try to force it in later, you may end up building mission critical systems that then have to be materially changed because, or retired because they are privacy law violations. So also build to the strictest standard. For most of us, that's going to be GDPR. Finally, work with a privacy lawyer. So privacy law is complicated, varied, and quickly changing. Even in California, there were new laws coming in in January. In Colorado, they literally had a new law coming in in July. And with the new stuff, who knows when that will be coming in and with what things you'll need to do. So. Just remember, the code that you write, the systems you work on, has a human impact. 
even if at the surface level, it doesn't seem that way. So we as security engineers, we're the stewards of our users' data. So it's important to know how users are expecting us to protect their identity because it's the right thing to do, even if it takes a little bit more time or effort to build. Because after all, at the end of the day, I know that you would want the company that's responsible for your PII to be doing the utmost care and consideration with your data and be doing the right thing too. Once again, my name is Christina Liu. I want to say thank you to B-Sites. That is a QR code to a LinkedIn, not anything nefarious. Um, thank you to everyone here on the camera, our volunteers, and our AV staff. Thank you. Is there time for questions? No? OK, two. I have two questions. Going once, going twice. Oh, OK. Uh, do you think some form of anonymity could help in applications with saving users' data? Is there any research in that area? Yeah, so there is, there are like functions and things. They're called, um, my brain at the moment, like K anonymity and, um, oh, I can't, it's like L something. It's very mathy. Um, but basically, like a lot of data scientists are already doing these type anonymization functions. They're kind of, unfortunately, the best things we have right now, but they're not perfect. So they can still be um, reverse engineered because true anonymization is actually incredibly difficult. Yeah. Are there any uh, tips for uh, unstructured data, like large? Oh, yeah. Sort of, yeah. So, um, if you just need data to play with, there is a great website called Kaggle, which is K-A-G-G-E-L. They have data on all sorts of things. My favorite one right now is like the Thailand tourism data one. So it's fascinating to see what Thailand is doing. Um, and if you just need something to generate like a JSON blob or something real quick, there is a website called Makaru that will absolutely do that for you with actual random data. Because you shouldn't be testing with prod data. Ever. <laughs> Is that it? Oh, yeah. There was a talk a little bit earlier um, this morning about machine learning and kind of the remote spyware, bossware, as people are calling it, right? Um, one of the things that I, I think is interesting, I want your perspective on, is as companies have started tracking employee usage, heuristics data, generating all this stuff to put together insider threat profiles, all kind of other things. You can make an argument that that could be considered PII because it's yeah. fingerprinted and unique to you, like biometric data. Yeah. What do you see that kind of turning into? So actually, California this year, one of the um, expansions on the California Privacy Rights Act is that there is a PII uh, category specifically for employees. So this was like the old stuff was just general like yeah. regular people, but California specifically has one for um, their employees. Internally. So and I don't I don't know like what other states do or don't. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> so <laughs> hashtag not legal. Yeah, advice. not legal advice. <laughs> I think a lot of people in the crowd are probably in security engineering and stuff like that. How do you justify a lot of these initiatives to management and the wider organization within what you're doing, right? Because sometimes yeah. these things can fall down in priority or go up in priority. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, well, the GDPR fines are very expensive. <laughs> so like if it's a less severe violation in GDPR, Okay, so they give you, they give you choices. Um, the less severe violation, it's 2% of last year's revenue. Or I think it's 10 million euro, whichever's higher. And then if it's a severe violation, it is 4% of last year's revenue or 20 million euro, again, whichever's higher. So not getting fined <laughs> is probably a good impetus. Is that it? 
Do you, are you, are you woohooing? Once, twice, thrice, sold!